So, we studied the melting point of an ionic compound in the last question and we understood how the formation of these compounds, their interaction with uh, other molecules or with the solvent is based to a very large extent on the intermolecular forces at play. What we are going to try and do here is try and understand how the formation of an ionic compound takes place and what are the forces associated with something like this and what are the most favorable cases for an ionic compound to be formed based on the two particular energies that is ionization energy and electron affinity so we're going to start this off and um, what do you say so thank you rahul let's start with the what is ionization energy yeah ionization energy it's the energy we have to give to a molecule um, have to give to a molecule to remove an electron from its valence shell to remove an electron from its valence shell right uh, yeah. basically to create a cation when we have say an a converting an a into an a plus plus an electron so we've got to give it some energy so that the electron is excited and it exits the valence shell so that particular energy is called ionization energy yeah so the now the second term we're looking at is electron, electron affinity. affinity what is electron affinity it's the energy which is liberated by a molecule or an ion on accepting an electron on accepting an electron in its valence shell yeah valence shell that's very important so basically when we have say a b and we add an electron to it and convert it into an anion b minus uh, the energy that is liberated is called the activation energy as such right yeah uh, electron affinity oh yeah electron affinity i'm sorry activation energy is the energy we have to give or to be able to remove an electron right that is ionization energy wait what did i say <laughs> you said activation energy oh i'm so sorry we are just confusing different <laughs> concepts across the line so yes ionization energy and electron affinity so ionization energy is the energy that we have to give electron affinity dictates the amount of energy that is released so coming back yeah now we know for a molecule to be more stable that the total energy should be minimum so any molecule try to attain minimum potential energy okay which means that when it's being formed it should release a lot of energy right yeah so what it effectively means is we now need to see that the energy coming in is the ionization energy and the energy leaving is the activation energy right electron affinity oh i'm so sorry activation energy is all over the place electron affinity yes ionization energy and electron affinity so so we got to what have we got to do with the two of them now yeah uh, in this case the il il ionization energy is positive and the basic reason is we are removing an electron from the atom like na is giving an electron to form na plus an electron therefore we need to supply it energy therefore i is is always positive okay and whereas electron affinity for the first electron is always negative okay only for the first electron it can then turn positive yeah okay uh, first of all like in the case of cl which is 2s2 2p5 uh, it is becoming 3s2 3p5 it is becoming uh, 3s2 3p6 and hence attaining a noble gas configuration and hence it is becoming more stable so therefore it is releasing energy because cl minus has less energy compared to cl okay therefore electron affinity is always negative 
whereas only for the first electron yeah only for the first electron whereas in the case of oxygen uh, we get a electron uh, and hence energy is related electron affinity for the first electron and mm. it is ea1 is negative okay but when it forms the second electron ea2 is positive and the basic reason for that is there is already one electron existing in its outer shell so that electron is going to repulse, repulse the oh. el other electron coming therefore ea2 will be positive so it means we have to supply energy for it yeah to be able to accept an electron as such mm. all right so coming back to the question at hand uh, we we now have two components which is ionization energy and electron affinity mm. so what is a favorable situation for both of these values to be as the compound is a plus and p minus therefore for a compound to be maximum stable it should have minimum potential energy okay therefore a should have low ip low ionization energy okay and p should have high electron affinity so as the product of the energies of a plus plus p minus energies okay that is ie minus electron affinity here it's a plus but as we know electron affinity is negative and i is plus so it turns out to be overall negative okay so as the compound is more negative the total energy is more negative it's more stable because it is getting the minimum potential energy okay so we need to basically minimize the energy entering the compound and maximize the energy leaving, leaving the, compound the compound as a result of the electron exchange yeah okay therefore uh, a minimum and b maximum right yeah, which is I option e should b. be low and b should be high okay electron affinity should be high all right so i think with this we've cracked this question uh, we've understood the concept that for greater stability we need to have the minimum possible energy state and to get that minimum possible energy state we have to minimize the energy intake and maximize the energy output or outtake as such so for any such questions in future on base of ionization energy and electron affinity you can directly do that questions on the basis of sign that i will be positive and ea will be negative ea1 will be negative okay that's it thank you devansh Now that we've understood what are favorable conditions for the formation of a particular compound, let's try and see what kind of compounds exist and what kinds of compounds don't exist and why is that the case. The same way we were talking about how if there's a bond order of zero, a compound can never exist. Uh, similarly, there could be other reasons as to why compounds are unable to exist. It could be, well, I guess, steric hindrance. It could be a lot of repulsion. it could be instability basically so again it comes back to what kind of molecular interactions are taking place and what kind of bonding is present between elements or compounds as such so the question we're now going to deal with is called why does clf3 exist and fcl3 does not so devansh would you care to enlighten us yeah first of all in clf3 the central atom is cl okay Uh, let us go for electronic configuration of cl uh, for the outermost shell which is uh, 3s2 and 3s2 3p5 and 3d0 okay so assuming all the principles the uh, outermost electronic configuration is like this uh so you can see here that cl is having vacant d orbitals okay so this is the basic reason which we have uh, understood in the first question that we provide some excitation energy 
and the electrons move so basically a compound should have empty d orbitals so that whatever the electrons which are excited it can accommodate okay it's so obvious whereas compound like fcl3 the central atom is f and if we see the electron configuration of its outermost orbit it is 2s2 and 2s2 and 2p5 2p5 and it has no d orbitals which so 2s2 will have two electrons right or is two, that mr yeah. only okay all right so it is it it seems to be fairly straightforward right like you need empty d orbitals and if empty d yeah. orbitals aren't present uh, it's just not a possibility right mm. is that the idea behind it yeah this is the basic idea uh, uh, that why fcl3 is not formed and clf3 is formed all right so now we're going to figure out how to arrange the molecules in an increasing order on the basis of the dipole moment the molecules in front of us are bf3 nf3 and nh3 so i guess we're going to start off with drawing the diagrams first devansh what do you say yeah and in this question basically we will learn about dipole moment okay so bf3 all right by hybridization method we know it contains three electrons in its valence shell okay plus 3 4 3, 3 monovalent fluorine atoms okay now by 2 we get 3 oh this is the same formula we were using yeah. earlier right oh that's good it's the same formula and so the hybridization come as sp2 okay so that is trigonal planar so its structure will be b f f and f and the direction of dipole we know it's always from negative to positive so uh, from positive to negative so therefore it will be like this so basically to remember you all know that fluorine is a highly electronegative compound so it's going to draw the electron towards itself which is why the flow will be from boron towards fluorine from positive to negative Yeah. Let's look at the next one, which is NF three. So now in NF three, as we know, for nitrogen, the, the electrons in outermost shell is five. Okay. Plus three for fluorine, by two, which, which will be four, which okay. is sp three. Oh, interesting, isn't it? Like yeah, same number of uh, atoms attached with it, but a completely different configuration. So how will this turn out to be? This is tetrahedral, uh, but as we can have one lone pair of nitrogen so trigonal bipyramidal it's going to be tri trigonal pyramidal okay so which will be nitrogen a lone pair on top of it a lone yeah. pair and three fluorine atoms All right. So once again, the direction of the flow of charge is going to be from nitrogen to fluorine, nitrogen to fluorine. And But here the interesting it? point is the lone pair will always go up like this. Okay. So uh, the lone pair will go up entails what? Means exactly. the lone pair will okay. show the direction of dipole for itself. Is it here? We are showing lone pair on the vertical side. Okay. All right. Positive so, to negative. Ha. Huh, so direction will be like this for lone pair. Okay, all right. If we have drawn lone pair here, so direction will be down. Okay, but then F would consequently be up. Yeah. To an extent, all right. Mm. So it's going to be in the direction opposite to the opposite to the direction of fluorine, fluorine. the lone pair. Okay, all right. And what's and the last one? And there is an NH3. It's again five plus three by two four. Sp three. And the same trigonal pyramidal. Okay. But here the main change will be in this direction. The okay. dipole will be like this. Okay, so from hydrogen towards 
nitrogen as such yeah because hydrogen is more electropositive compared to nitrogen or we can say nitrogen is more electronegative as compared to hydrogen or uh, not so yeah so now how do we compare their dipole moments as such from what i see for uh, bf3 the three of them are going to cancel out right yeah because uh-huh. it's a symmetric structure and it's planar okay so dipole moment over here is zero Okay, so now it's a question of finding out which has a higher dipole moment, NF three or NH three. And in NH three, you can see that all the dipoles are going in one direction, which is upwards. Yeah, therefore direction will be high. Okay. And here, fluorine dipole moment minus dipole moment of lone pair, so relatively low dipole moment. Okay, because as you can see, as we in studied in physics, as we studied in physics. Um, it's basically like components so the three fluorines are adding together to be in the direction opposite to nitrogen while in the second case which is with nh3 the three hydrogen atoms are adding the dipole moment together to be in the direction of the lone pair as well so we consequently see that the sum of both of these is definitely greater than a subtraction that will happen regardless of the magnitude of uh, fluorine atoms is is yeah. it a possibility that uh, hypothetically the dipole moment due to fluorine could be so high that even if you reduce the dipole moment of the lone pair it could still end up being greater than the dipole moment of, of hydrogen, hydrogen plus lone pair yeah is there a possibility uh, uh, it is a possibility but the in that case you have to get something more electronegative than fluorine and practically it's not and there's nothing more electronegative than fluorine and we already have from data that yeah. with nf3 and nh3 nf3 yeah is it has a lesser dipole it has a dipole there. around 0.76 and this has around 1.86 oh so so that's a huge difference and we will need to get a very electronegative substance which doesn't exist yeah so now we know very clearly addition and of the dipole moments is a good idea for a simple trick to remember electronegativity if you want Uh, for the second period it's like carbon nitrogen oxygen fluorine if you go uh, it's for fluorine it's 4 for oxygen it's 3.5 for nitrogen it's 3 for carbon it's 2.5 and for boron it's 2 uh, what are these numbers that you're writing now this so is electronegativity okay so how exactly does this electronegativity help second period us? So basically, if you want to compare compare for any other atom, okay. like if in this case here is fluorine, if any other Cl or oxygen, if you want to compare, it will help. This is just an ex. This is just an experimental data, which just helps in a normal way to keep an idea when uh-huh. you're going to be able to solve yeah. questions. So having more context primarily. Mm-hmm. All right. So in this question, we basically learned. Uh, how we first to be able to determine the dipole moment we first need to be able to figure out its geometry because that's very important as you can see all of them have three atoms that their the central atom is associated with but the structures are completely different uh, even within structures once we understand their structure we need to understand the direction of the dipole moment which is always positive towards negative from a mm, less electronegative element to a high electronegative element and the directions can also make much as a lot of a difference as we saw with nf3 and nh3 that is the most important point for dipole moment okay the most important point is always direction is from electropositive to, to electronegative electronegative definitely this is something you should remember so remember geometry case, and direction right that's it all right then so i think we're done let's move on to the next question yeah